Ala Upa was filled with pitch darkness and was weakly illuminated by a lame moonlight which hung in the sky like a maltreated houseboy. In an hut, Obiakor and Dolachi sat on the floor. Their mother, Urenma, would frequently come into the hut and spit on the ground near them. She burnt with inhuman rage and hatred toward them. The children could hardly recognize her as their mother. She seemed to have lost her soul. Whatever took hold of her was eating her up fast. In one of her stomps into the hut where they were held, Olachi noticed something like a squirrel on her mother's back. It looked very much evil and seemed to be sucking the life out of her. As soon as Urenma stormed out of the hut, Olachi told Obiako what she observed. Ola, if that be the evil which has taken over her mind and soul, then we should attack. We should at least try to save her. How do we do it, Obi? You will play dead and I will call for help. When she rushes in and backs me, I will pull out the evil from her back. The plan seemed good to Olachi, and so she asked that they do it immediately. On the day of the wrestling match, Uka and its neighbors dropped out. They knew Obinza had a great wrestling bout with an unidentified opponent. Some had claimed that the opponent was Ohadili, and many laughed it off. There was no way Ojadili, who died long ago, would come to life to fight the land death crouched in shadows, waiting for the signal to snatch lives from men. Ojadili and some men who camouflaged as humans made it to the wrestling ground, and the crowd cheered him loudly. They still did not know who he was. Minutes later, Obinza arrived with Ihele. Iyele camouflaged as a young man and bore Obinze's machetes. At the sight of Obinze, the land of Uke went into frenzied excitement. However, there were a few chiefs who cursed him under their breaths. They were the chiefs who had been planting charms against him. Those chiefs who were swayed by the river world to influence people against him. While Obinze made it to his corner, the crowd waited to see Urenma. She was the reason for the wrestling match as they were told. The river world wanted her back and they sent their champion wrestler to come fight Obinza and bring her back. They did not know yet that all was a lie. Then the Ikoro began to sound and the two wrestlers were invited to greet the crowd and tell them who they were. Ojadili was the first to speak, the privilege always given to guest wrestlers. I am the legend you heard about in tales told by Moonlight. I am the legend old women wove into many stories. I am the legend your grandfather spoke of and beat their chests. I am the legend young women spoke of with joyful tears in their eyes. I am... He paused. Ojadili, and I will destroy this fly, he shouted and pointed at Obinze. Having made known who he was, he returned to his seat. The crowd did not cheer, though they were meant to. Many shrank from the wrestling ground, including the very elders who wanted Obinze dead. There was silence. Absolute silence. The crowd could not understand how Ojadili came back to life, wasn't he supposed to be dead? As they stared at him unbelievably, they saw evil in his eyes. Then it occurred to those chiefs and elders who were against Obinza that they had been played by the river world. They hurried to a corner of the wrestling ground and conferred with each other. There was no way they would let Obinza their son fight the dead. Enzi Namiri stormed into the wrestling ground and raised his hand to speak. We were told that Obinza would fight a great wrestler from a far land and not the dead. Ojadili died long ago. This fight has been nullified. When the river world presents a qualified wrestler, then Obinze would fight. The crowd who thought that they had seen the end of Obinze celebrated wildly. Then Obinz, who had a fuller knowledge of what was in play, stood up and entered the wrestling ground. Raising his hand, he calmed the crowd and said, You may not know what awaits you today, the people of Uke. If I fight not, our land shall be overrun by those who hate us, and if I fight, our land shall still be pillaged. I say to you, run. Run while you may. Go home, find children and run. The roads out of Uka have been blocked. I will not let this fight pass me by. I, Obins, shall stand and fight. I shall not disappoint those who went through pains to bring this thing back to life. If it is beast, human or spirit, Obinza shall fight it. Many did not understand what Obinza said, but there were those who ran home. They could not understand how the river world could bring back a dead man to fight Obinza. Others remained on the wrestling ground to see how it would turn out. When Obinza saw that many remained, he cried out, Send for your machetes, go find your spears. If you have no weapon, go borrow from your nails, for war is upon us. They still did not understand Obinza, but they were worried. Seeing his people could not understand him, 
he turned, made a stand and waited for the fight to begin. Because the elders and chiefs of Uke did not approve of the fight, they refused to wait for the match to begin. A spirit which camouflaged as one of the elders who accompanied Ojadili to Uke ran into the wrestling ground and waved for the match to begin. Ojadil lunged forward at the speed of light and lifted Obinza with one arm and slammed him on the ground. Obinza's excruciating cry sent many running away from the wrestling ground. Ojadili gave him no chance at all. He moved in on him yet again and slammed him on the ground. To the few who remained to watch the fight, that was the end of Obinza. Blood gushed from his mouth and he went into spasm, as he lay on the ground writhing and obviously dying slowing. Ojadili gloated and gave a sign to the spirits who swarmed the land to run through it as soon as he finished Obinze off. Turning, Ohadili ran toward Obinze who lay limp on the ground. As he drew nearer, Ijele began to laugh until his laugh grew very loud. Ohadili stopped and lifted Obinze for all to see. He knew his next attack would be the end of the once legendary wrestler. While he suspended Obinze's flaccid body in the air, Ijele laughed on. Then Ojadili staggered a bit. Obinza was gaining weight, yet again he staggered. The weight was becoming too much for him to bear, and so he dropped him on the ground and moved back to study him. At this point, Ijele stood up and began to praise Obinza. Turning to the young men who were brave enough to stay back and watch the fight, he asked, Is there no song in this land you sing with Obinza's name in it? The young men looked forlorn and showed no courage to sing or have faith in Obinza. As long as they were concerned, Obinza was dead. Ijele gyrated around and asked the young men to sing for Obinza. Ijele's belief was infectious. Lamely, the young men picked up the song, Obinza Ebubediki, Ebubediki, Obinza Ebubediki, Ebubediki, Obinza Ebubediki. As they sang, the drummers joined them, and then the gong was heard. Hands claps were heard. Finally, Uke began to sing to their hero and their voice went up. Like a wild beast, Ojadili ran to lift Obinza again. Alas, he could not. He moved back and stared unbelievably at the spirits whom he came with. He was forced to turn around and look at Oninze's direction when the crowd began to shout insanely. Obinza was sitting on the bare floor cleaning blood from his mouth with the back of his hands. The celebratory shout from the wrestling ground was so loud that those who had ran home in fear began to run back to the wrestling ground. And as they came back, they bore weapons of warfare. Painfully, Obinze stuttered to his feet. Ojadili ran to him to sweep him off his feet. But Obinza did not bother to attack him. He simply stooped a bit and bounced at Ojadili. Many people at that stunt from Obinze, Uke went nuts with excitement. Their hero was back and he was making a dead legend look like his ilk. Ojadili attacked him again and this time Obinze repelled him with his famous punches. Clearly Ojadili did not know what to do with him anymore. So he resorted to his old wrestling skills and came for Obinze. Smartly Obinze parried his dangerous attacks. He was slowly getting into the groove. To all who watched the fight, it was obvious that Ojadili was not only a man who came from the dead, he also had something evil in him. His face was beginning to contort. That was Atari unwinding fully to kill Obinza. Obinza was no fool. He knew quite well that he was not in the same class with Ojadili. But someone who watched all Ojadili's fight and who was Ojadili's teacher had taught him well, Ijele. With Atari's full power surging through Ojadili, he came for Obinze. Obinze moved in on him and successfully held his two hands. As Ojadili tried to break free, Obinze shouted, Brother, this is my time, my generation and my land. Now be gone to where you came from. He crashed his head into Ojadili's chest, and just then the unthinkable happened. Ojadili went down violently to the ground. Their feet was unbelievable. In Igbo folklore, Ojadili's back never touched the ground in all his fights. He won all, whether against spirits or men standing on his feet. Shocked, stunned and embarrassed, Ojadili jumped to his feet. From where they stood and watched, Nsha and the 19 gods knew they were going to have their hands full. The wrestling match which they had expected to last a brief moment had taken longer than they planned. Unknown to Nsha and his army, Obinza was only holding off Ojadili, hoping that a miracle would happen and his family would make it out of Alaupa. When they do, he won't be wrestling. He would be butchering spirits who had entered his land. In anger to what Obinze did to him, Ojadili began to attack Obinze viciously, using the full power and energy of Atari. For a long spell of time, Obinze stuck to the lessons he had learnt and frustrated Ojadili. 
But then he made a mistake. He left his arm flailing in Ojadili's face. Ojadili pounced like a cat, twisted and pulled Obinze's arm from his shoulder. Obinze's cry froze the hearts of those who watched. The arm was pulled off completely. The only thing which held it was a lump of flesh. Obinza knew it was over and the people of Uka knew it was over. Their son had fought bravely. There was nothing to be ashamed about the way he fought. He was the only man in all of history to bring Ohadili down in a fight. As Obinze lay on the ground and expected his life to be taken from him, Nsha and his army began to close in on Uke. Ojadili ran around the wrestling ground and celebrated wildly. From one of the spirits who accompanied him to Uke, he took a machete and ran to where Obinze lay and raised it to behead him. A hand held the machete from behind. No one could say how he got on the wrestling ground. They only saw him standing behind Oshadili. With his right hand he held Ojadili's machete and with his left hand he dug into Ojadili's stomach and pulled out his intestines. Obiakor, the son of Obinze, had made it out of Alaupa just in time to save his father. Wrestling the machete from Ojadili, he threw it away. Uke echoed at the sight of a teenage boy tearing Ojadili to shreds with bare hands. He attacked Ojadili like a wounded lion, tearing his arms, ears, jaws and limbs off. And Shah and the army he led stood still and completely puzzled at what they saw. Picking up the machete he threw away, he staring at it disdainfully before using it to lump off Ojadili's head. A boy saw the look in Obiakor's face when he looked at the machete. He understood the meaning in his eyes, and so he bolted from the wrestling ground to Obinza's house. When Insha thought he had seen it all, a shout was heard. It was an unmistakable shout. Insha knew the voice and the people of Uka knew it also. Urinma was back. Like a lightning she descended on the wrestling ground. She had regained her mind. Her children succeeded in their plan to remove the abomination of the damned spirits, which attached itself to her back and took over her mind. Beside her was her daughter Olachi. When she saw Obins lying helplessly on the ground, her heart threatened to explode with rage. She ran and knelt beside him. Obins was misty-eyed when he saw his wife. He knew she would never leave him. There was no time for kisses and hugs. War was upon them. Insha and his army of monsters had made themselves visible. The people of Uke were on the run. Obinza pleaded with Urenma. Ureim, can you give me back my arm, that I may rise and fight by your side? I shall give you much more, Urenma shouted. Urenma pushed Obinza's arm back to its socket. Loosening her hair, she threw the whole flock of it on Obinza, and many of her hair went into him. The both of them stood to their feet, and Ihele, who all along had presented himself as a young man, transformed back to his true nature and threw Obinze's machetes at him. He grabbed them and ran to meet Ansha and his army. Behind him, Urenma, Olachi, Obiako and Ijele followed. Obiako and Olachi ran to the battle barehanded. Their favorite weapons were at home. As they ran to meet the innumerable company which came out of the river world to lay their land waste, a boy was seen running to the battle. Ijele tracked back to stop the boy. This place is not for your kind. Go back! Ihele barked. The boy raised the raffia sack in his hand and said, I brought these for Obiakor and Olachi. Ihele took the sack from him and sent him back. When they got their weapons and began to fight, Nisha realized that he had made inadequate plans. He had focused on the wrong people. No one told him that Urenma and Obinza gave birth to death. The gods above had hidden it from him. The two children were born for days like that day. Like sheaves, Damned and pure spirits fell at the swiping of their blades. Urenma left the damned and pure spirits to her husband and children, and with Ijele went after Ansha and the nineteen gods. She bore no fear for them. She too was a goddess and the goddess of war. The clash between Ansha and the nineteen gods shook the ground and trees. Houses sunk into the ground and trees split apart. Ijele was an expert fighter, though he ranked low amongst the gods, but the art of war was his specialty. He withstood the gods bravely, and while he fought, he laughed like he was drunk. Urenma poured her venom on the gods who shielded Insha, and as quickly as they gave her the slightest chance, she tore them to pieces. They were all doing fine, but the number against them was too great. Some spirits were running into the village and destroying men, women, children and animals. She knew she must summon Ntani, the princesses and the army she had gathered. The only person who could do that, given the circumstances they were in, was Obinze. 
So she sent Ihele to fetch her husband and withstood the 19 guards and Insha alone. In a flash, Ihele returned with Obinze. Ihele took her place against the gods while she gave instructions to Obinze. But she didn't have to send for Antani. Antani was already on the battleground. The gods above had sent for her. Her shout of war brightened Durenma's face. Her arrival with the army evened out their number against the Shah and his army. However, the gods above were not done playing their cards against the rebellious Nsha. As the battleground took on a new look with the arrival of Antani and her fighting horde, a horn was heard. It meant the gods above had sent their army to fight. At this point, Nsha knew he had to use all he had known as a god and much more to survive the battle. The spirits above poured into the battle and targeted Nsha's strength in the battle, which was the damned spirits. One after another they fell, the army above routed them from the hinterlands of Uka back to the battleground. The army of the river world was immensely decreased by the superior fighting skills of Antani and the princesses. As the number of Ensha's army decreased, Obiako and Olakil turned their attention to the very people who brought the war to Uka Nsha and the 19 gods, some of whom Urenma had subdued. When Urenma saw her children running to engage the gods, she cried and tried to send them back. They are not your equal. Stay with the lower spirits, she shouted. However, what she did not know was that the gods above had planned to humiliate Ansha by the hands of her children. Ignoring their mother, they engaged the gods. With bathed breath, Urenma watched to see if her children would emerge from the blast, which followed the clash of the gods and her children. When the dust and light receded, her two children were on their feet moving, hacking and stabbing the gods menacingly. Ensha was an evil genius. He quickly figured out what the gods above were up to something. The children were not normal. They must have received a gift from the gods above. And so he smartly stayed out of their way and preferred to engage Urenma, someone he knew and had lived with. But even that was a mistake. As soon as Ensha and Urenma faced each other alone, she brought him down seven times. Suddenly, Ensha, the ruthless and mighty god, could not find his ilk on the battleground. Everyone seemed to be ahead of him. The gods above had played a mighty trick on him. His second revolt would end in a manner worse than the first. When Olachi and Obiako had disposed the last of the 19 gods, they came for Ensha, the gods who locked their mother in a cage. They still remembered. Ensha was having problem containing Urenma. Now how would he handle her along with her two young devils? As though that was not enough, Entani joined Urenma and her children against Nsha. There was no running away from the battle. He must stand and fight. Then Obinze, having seen off the last of the army of the river world, joined his family and Entani against Nsha. They hacked him with their blades, stabbed him and parried his attacks and lightning until Nsha went down on his knees. Above him stood Obiako and Olachi, cutting into him like they were slaughtering a cow at New Yam Festival. Obinze, Urenma and Antani retreated and allowed the teenagers to have fun with the proud and wicked god. Ensha was certain that the Council of Gods above did something to him. And the 19 gods, the battle was not meant to end the way it did. From the highlands to the lowlands of Uka, human and spirits' bodies lay on the ground. There had never been any time there was such a body count of spirits in battle. On the ground lay uncountable number of pure spirits from the river world, the damned spirits and the army from above. The most horrifying sights were humans torn apart by the damned spirits. Some of them were feasted on by those spirits. Children were beheaded and mothers cut in two. While men and boys had their testicles and heats pulled off from their bodies. Most parts of Uke were drenched with blood. Farms, trees and rivers were destroyed. When Ninsha fell down and could not rise to fight, Urenma bound him with her hair and the army from above left with him to be judged by the Council of Gods. All the spirits who fell in battle were sent to the river world, where they were to be judged and bound or have their strengths given back to them, depending on which side they fought in the battle. After the battle was over and humans began to move about freely in Uke once again, the gods above sent their messengers to announce that the children of the gods could be born to men again in Uka, just like in the days of old. Urenma and Obins determined to know who their children really were, left with the messengers of the gods for answers about their children. Obinza and Urenma were not seen in Uka for a long time. In their absence, their children grew mighty in the land. 
Many young and wealthy men came seeking Olachi's hand in marriage. In the absence of her father, she gave them a task. Anyone who could beat her in a fight would have her hand in marriage. She had all the time to be silly. Her parents were not around. None could win her hand for marriage in a fight. Until a handsome boy came from Umwekwele, a land afar from Uke. The boy did not win her hand in a fight. He stole her heart with his flute and songs. Obinze and Urenma came back to Uke, having find out who their children was. Obiakor and Olachi were happy to see their parents after a long period of time. And they all lived as a mighty happy family. Obiakor, Obinze and Antani fall in love and they got married. <laughs>